right now, I think the pandemic has um, really um, pushed this concept of automation to the forefront and it's being uh, applied in a lot of industries and a lot of different parts of industries that maybe before the pandemic, uh, people were, well, they had less of an urgency to do so. Uh, for hotels, the concept here is that uh, through automation, you're going to be able to price your product in a way that better reflects true and current market and purchasing conditions. Um, so given current conditions and what is really looking to be an unpredictable future for the next 24 months, I think this is the right time for industry to talk about this subject. Um, because up until now, most hotel revenue management, and this is really what we're talking about here, it's been based on historical precedent. I uh, will say, let's look at uh, last month, uh, last quarter, uh, what's year, year over year. Um, you know, we're looking for the past in, as to, to create a baseline to beat or improve upon. The problem, of course, is that this year has basically been a wash um, with the pandemic. And the next 24 months is looking to be a wild ride as different markets recover at different rates. Uh, and for different segments. Um, we're going to have shorter booking windows. We're going to continue to have um, cancellations, uh, new and different feeder markets um, because of new and different travel patterns, et cetera, et cetera. What has happened in the past is going to be very, it, it, it's going to be um, not as important in terms of predicting the future. Um, so the question is, you know, where does pricing automation come in and how can it help? Um, our panel today is going to explain how pricing automation is going to be a central theme for hotels today um, as they ride to recovery. Um, and we're also going to be talking about the component parts of pricing automation and some of the tangential um, features and functions. Um, before we get into that, I'm going to ask the panelists to um, introduce themselves. We'll kind of just go around the table. Um, uh, we'll start with uh, Michael Linton. Can you give us a small introduction? Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. My name is Michael Linton. I'm Vice President of Sales at Pegasus for North America, based out of Las Vegas with a in-depth background in revenue management and uh, online travel stemming from when to uh, Orbit's Travelocity and Vegas.com. Happy to be here with you all today. Thank you. Um, um, Michael McCartan, can you please uh, give us a quick background? Yes, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, I'm Michael McCartan. I'm the Chief uh, Growth Officer at Atomize. Um, but I've got about 20 years experience in hotel technology uh, from distribution right through to revenue management uh, uh, technology. And uh, yeah, for the last five or six years, uh, specialized in, in revenue management, uh, which is obviously what Atomize's uh, current uh, strength is. Excellent, thank you. And we have yet a third Michael, Michael Murnog. Please give us a, a quick introduction. Oh, I think Michael, you're still on mute. There you go. Well, I'll tell you what, um, Michael, there we go. Okay, schoolboy era, thank you very much, uh, Paul. I had all trying not to go. So anyway, my name's Michael. Um, nice to meet you, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, head of sales for OTA Insight here in Amir. I'm based in London and uh, looking forward to uh, an interesting and incisive uh, panel today. Thank you. Uh, so we've got a lot of Michaels, so I'm probably going to sound a little bit formal as I say full names or Mr. or that or the other. So for, forgive me, we, we've got too many Michaels on this webinar, I think. Um, and then finally, we have um, uh, Don de Bruyne joining us from Sweden. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, and hi, everyone. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon. And thanks a lot uh, to you, Paul, and to Roomdex for the initiative. Uh, my name is, is Dan de Bruyne. I'm the co-founder and head of sales at BookBoost, which is an all-in-one digital communication platform for the hotelier who believes that building a direct relationship with their guests throughout all phases of the guest journey, so from pre-booking, uh, throughout pre-stay, in-stay, and also after the stay, uh, is important. And I'm very much looking forward to, to the webinar today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and, and lastly, um, we want to... Uh... Uh, ask uh, Jos Schaap to introduce himself. Yes, hi Paul. Uh, my name is Jos. Uh, I am founder, uh, sorry, co-founder uh, and CEO at Roomdex. Founded the company last year, 
uh, spring, just around the time COVID started. Prior to that, uh, I was uh, a founder uh, of Stay in Touch PMS. I uh, sold that to CG in 2018. And prior to that, I worked for 18 years as SVP of product and engineering uh, for Micros uh, on the Opera product development platform. Excellent. Thanks. So for the audience, um, we're going to try to also take audience questions today. Um, there is a Q&A function uh, within Zoom. Um, and we'll look at that. Uh, sometimes people are using the chat. Um, if we can try to keep in the Q&A, that's great. But we'll try to get to whatever questions that we can. We'll pause along the way. Uh, so please um, feel free. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just kick this off. I, I'm going to uh, start with the basics. Um, pricing automation. Um, Michael McCartan, can you give us your definition of pricing automation and, and, and kind of tell us about what the core components of that are? Yeah, so thank you very much, Paul. So automation obviously is getting a lot of attention right now because of the unpredictable nature of demand based on the pandemic. Um, but even before the pandemic, hotels that utilized pricing automation Automization were, uh, automation were at a competitive advantage because they were able to detect changes in demand patterns long before their competitors could, and they were able to adjust their pricing accordingly. So the result of that was they were able to uh, push the right price to the right guest at the right time and capture a greater share of that demand. And that put them, at a, as I said, at a competitive advantage and maximize the revenue opportunities for them. And I think the best example that I can give, and this goes back a few years, was a, a, a customer of mine was based in Glasgow in Scotland and Ed Sheeran announced a, a new concert um, at short notice because the other, the other dates had been booked out. And he announced this on a Friday night and obviously the re hotel's revenue team was at home. Um, no one was looking at their revenue systems. And the hotel sold out uh, in, in half an hour at really low prices because this, this concert was on a, on, on a Sunday, which is, it was, a, was a soft date for them. But had they had automation in place uh, that detected that those <coughs> demand, detected that activity on the website, detected the, the pickup and it coming through on the books, they would have been able to adjust the, their prices in real time, push those prices out, and, and validate whether those prices were optimal and hence convert much, much, much great, uh, at, at much higher revenues than they would have done. So clearly there's an advantage for hotels that adopt revenue management. Um, and and be, driving that automation is really two, two key components in my opinion. And the one is a good, steady, reliable source of data. I see data as the oxygen that feeds the revenue management system and without good data, it can't perform optimally. And the second is the ability for that revenue management system to optimize in real time. As with that Ed Sheeran example, um, not, it's no good detecting the, the, the changes in dem demand. You need to respond to those demands, that, that, those changes in real time. And we have a saying in Atomize that we, live our, we don't live our lives in eight hour chunks, which is typically when a, a traditional revenue management system would optimize. We live it second by second and, and the revenue management system needs to respond second by second. So with those two components, you really are uh, setting yourself up for, for success in terms of pricing automation. So, so look, a quick question on that. So um, what would you say the difference would be between something that's pricing automation in revenue management versus something that would be um, uh, more like setting parameters, setting limitations? Is there, is there, is pricing automation, because I think there's, there's always been, there's been some level of controls over pricing um, digitally for a while now. What what makes pricing automation different? Yeah, so what you're describing is possibly a rules-based scenario where the revenue management manager would, um, based on their knowledge and of, of the market and uh, of, of their strategy, define certain parameters and, you know, based on occupancy or based on sort of price limits being, being achieved, price points being achieved, then determine a price change. But the reality is by setting up rules, you're constraining your uh, ability to actually push the right price at the right time. Um, so you, you start limiting your ability to really maximize the, the opportunity in the marketplace. Um, you know, in, in that Ed Sheeran case, it was a, a very basic budget hotel and they could have sold their, their hotel for uh, nearly 200 pounds a night because there was so much demand. But if, had they constrained that with rules, they probably would have stopped at 100 pounds or something like that. 
Right, right. So, um, so Michael McCartan mentioned something about um, data being the oxygen. Uh, Michael Murdoch, I'd like to get your you to weigh in on that on that concept. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Hi again, everybody. Um, as Michael has already said, pricing automation is dependent on data from multiple sources normally, and it being accurate, uh, real time to be that uh, real time optimization, and it's got to be relevant data to automating pricing decisions. And so typically is sourced from both the internal hotel systems and um, external sources. And as we know, the data is traditionally historical guest booking behaviors, current on the books data and rates from a fixed set of uh, competing hotels. So obviously at the moment, as you pointed out, these are less reliable from setting price in this current market. And we've learned from our hotel partners that since the pandemic, guest booking behaviors have changed as travel restrictions are changing, leisure and business events are no longer driving demand like Michael's uh, Ed Sheeran concert referred to. And obviously there's less corporate travel uh, so we're also finding booking windows are shortened to as little as two weeks and that hotels that have traditionally relied on corporate travel are now competing for leisure markets. So a hotel's competitor set is also much more dynamic than before. And importantly, our customers are telling us that this is here to stay. And as the market looks towards recovery and therefore existence in the new normal, um, it'll be like this for the foreseeable future. So talking about data going into um, the pricing decision and automation as well, to improve the accuracy of pricing and automation, new data sources are needed to help identify opportunity to yield better rev power and ADR. And that's why we're analyzing guest pre-booking flight and hotel search behavior, dynamically combining that with pricing from a wider set of competitors into tools to help hotels set prices based on forward-looking demand rather than only on traditional data components. Those traditional data components are not irrelevant, they're still relevant, but uh, the dependency on making good accurate pricing decisions is increasingly uh, dependent in this market on looking at forward looking data. So, so, so we, I think we all agree that the more data is going to be more, more oxygen and more fuel, but you'd mentioned something about relevancy. Can you kind of, um, how, how do you all, how do you determine the, the relevancy mix, you know, or the relevancy weight on a regular basis of different kinds of data? Um, you know, should, uh, should, you know, the price of airline flights into a market, you know, trump or be more, how, how is that more or less important than another piece of data that you may be pulling into the system, um, an OTA pricing or who, who knows what? Well, from an RMS point of view, I think Michael would be way better, uh, Michael McCartan would be way better uh, to answer that because uh, from our side of the coin, we are uh, ingesting a lot of search, custom behavior data, uh, pricing data from the market, and we build our algorithms for our tools uh, to weight that, as you describe, it's uh, machine language uh, based. Um, I'm not technical. I'm sure I could pull an engineer up who could absolutely give you great insight to that. But in terms of the pricing itself, the recommendations, et cetera. That's more Michael's, um, Michael's uh, bag. Yeah, Michael McCartan, do you want anything to say about like, in terms of like data source relevancy and, and how that is uh, uh, managed? Yes, I mean, there is a danger that um, you take too much data and uh, not the right data. Um, and understanding the relevance of the data on the price and, and, and how reflective that is of demand is really important. Um, you know, you could, you could get yourself into a bit of a tailspin if you start looking at the wrong data. So, um, yeah, you know, buyer beware, I suppose. You need to make sure that the data that you're consuming and ingesting is relevant and does give you a predictable um, insight into future demand, because that's ultimate, ultimately what we're talking about. It's, you know, um, you need to somehow understand what's happening in the future through these data signals. And um, not all data signals are going to be relevant, and some of them might actually give a false negative. So, yeah, paying, paying close attention to, to the data and um, the relevance of that is, is very important. Thanks. Um, you know, uh, speaking of like kind of breadth, um, you know, Pegasus, um, Michael Linton, Pegasus is, deals with many revenue channels and many booking options. Uh, how are you seeing automatic or dynamic pricing fitting into the industry, especially in respect to uh, the current like low occupancy conditions that are going on? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, really from the, the CRS perspective, um, it's, you know, the, the vital goal um, on behalf of the CRS is really to just deploy all the different segmented pricing decisions to the various different channels, right? Because you can't apply, it's not one size fits all, you know, and that you're going to price your OTAs necessarily in the same way that you would price particular group or local or direct business. So, I mean, really what we've seen uh, hotel partners doing in light of the pandemic is leveraging the tools available within the CRS to segment out that uh, pricing strategy to make sure that they're optimizing, um, you know, the overall ADRs and RevPAR coming in uh, to the property. Because, I mean, I think uh, one of the Michaels <laughs> mentioned that uh, we're seeing a much shorter booking window. So it, hotels have to be prepared to, um, you know, adapt to that. So traditionally, they may be used to a 30-day booking window, you know, 45, 60-day booking window. Customers are now booking a couple of weeks out. Um, and that's been a pretty drastic change, particularly here in Las Vegas, where you have properties with, you know, in excess of 4,000 rooms on average. Um, that be, can be quite a task. And it can lead people to panicking, I think, by, you know, dropping rate and trying to fill the property up, um, which is never a good thing. So, you know, I think that the key is to have a CRS that has strong interfaces with various systems and all these data sources to bring it all together and to deploy that strategy out, um, you know, to a T, uh, it's something that can be quickly adapted and maneuvered based on market conditions because things are changing at a much more rapid paces uh, this day and age. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yas, what, what are your thoughts on, on uh, what he has to say there? I mean, you have a, a kind of a wide experience with PMS and in, in working with in different markets. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, Michael Linton hits, hits a few good points. And I think, you know, to follow what Michael McCartan was saying about the Ed Sheeran experience, I think what's happening, especially the last, you know, nine months with people booking late, we can also see it in our application that the booking windows are very short. And, and they're actually, you know, days sometimes, you know, the night before they book, uh, because yeah, it's so hard to determine, can I go, can I not go? So people wait last minute. There's no, if you last book last minute, the pricing is usually not very high. So it doesn't really matter to wait that long. But I think what it does is that um, for revenue managers that it, it complicates adjusting the price in time. Because if some, if you know, consumers book usually at night, whereas you know, business people book during the day, at night the revenue manager is no longer around; is probably doing his own thing. Uh, so the price is not being adjusted to to Michael McCarthy's early point, where it's, everything is automated. You have a the advantage of all these last minute bookings for every channel. You always have a, aware, or the system will have awareness of that. Whereas if you're a revenue manager without a system. You can do it, but it's very complicated to manage that on a spreadsheet at last minute and adjust the price. So I think, um, especially right now in these, in these low occupancy times where the booking window has shifted from far out to very close by on many multiple channels, uh, automation can really help and drive that, that, that rate up a little bit. It might not be much, but you know, right now, I think every little bit helps to get people uh, to A, come to your hotel and B, spend a little extra in that hotel. So I think automation is key um, with, with any booking pattern and every, every occupancy level. Hmm. So, so Michael McCartney, I'd like you to, if you could kind of respond and expand on this concept of, of the impact of a pricing automation on, on improving rate and rev par. Um, because I think obviously most of the folks that are, are dialing in today, they see in boosting ADR and RevPAR and that's, you know, pricing automation is fun and all, but we're looking for this outcome. And so, so what, what is the, how, do, how does pricing automation address that? Yeah, well, pricing automation definitely drives higher, higher ADRs and higher RevPARs. Ultimately, the objective of revenue management is to provide the optimal price um, to, in relation to guests' willingness to pay. So this concept of willingness to pay is a subjective um, measure, and you can only determine that by putting a price out there. And you'll see there will be X number of people looking at to book a, a hotel room in your destination at any point of time. Some of them will be very price sensitive, others less so. Um, and you need to constantly test and, and run um, 
tests on the, those those guests or those people that are looking to book your property to to test their willingness to pay. And so you have to run some simulations, and it's through those simulations that you determine the optimal price in to convert those guests for the maximum amount of revenue. And if you're able to do that through a combination of understanding the data that's been fed to your system, that forward-looking data that we spoke about, but also the data that's coming from your internal systems as a as a validation that you you now capturing, you, you've now pushed out the right price and capture, converting it at the maximum amount of guests at that price point. It's a constant feedback loop. You push the price out, you test it in the market, you run simulations to understand whether you're capturing the right amount of revenue. Um, if, 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 you're, if it doesn't tally, you then drop the price or increase your price again. And, and the, the cycle continues. So by doing that and constantly doing that to Yoss's point, you, you're then able to make my, micro changes to that price and constantly um, ensure that you, your, your price is, is, is the right price. So this is like in kind of almost like AB or multivariate testing kind of scenarios that we might see in, um, uh, in other technologies where, where you're, 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 you're running tests and comparing performance and things of that nature. Yeah, we don't in hotel and revenue management. We don't have the advantage of running A/B tests because there's only one price out there. So you can't say oh, I'm going to offer this price to 50% of the guests and another you know, another price to the other 50%. So you have to do these simulations and you have to validate those simulations in real time, and that's how you determine the optimal price. Mm, excellent. Um, <clears throat> does anyone want to weigh in on this? Like uh, specifically, you know, how this pricing automation is going to? We know that if you offer the best price you know, then by definition, you are going to be getting the best price. But over the long time, long term, like how is this going to impact ADR and part? Again, this particularly in light of recovery and low occupancy. Anybody want to raise their hand and add in their thoughts? I can, I can say something to that. I think that, um, I think it's a, a little bit of follow on, on what I said earlier already. The, the automation will 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 help uh, finding the right price, and which doesn't always mean it's the highest price. It probably means that it's the price that's not necessarily the highest. But you know, two people that buy a let's say medium price is more than one that ba buys the high price. So it's finding the balance between how many guests can I get for that price, rather than focusing on how do I get to the highest ADR, high, high, highest rate at that point in time only. And I think you can only do that when you have access to all these channels from which people make bookings and are looking rather than just booking. Nice, thank you. Um, so I wanted to take a moment and um, you know encourage uh, the audience to ask questions. We do have one question. It's very product specific, and we want to talk about concepts and less products here. But however. Um, anything that is a very product specific question, we will make sure we'll forward on to the appropriate person in on the panel and they can get back to you directly um, and answer those questions. Um, so, uh, so, so we just got a qu great question. So how do you access, get access to all the channels Yas just mentioned to get the relevant data? Um, and maybe that's a Michael Myrna question. I'm, I'm not really sure. Question is how do you get access to all the channels Yas just mentioned to get the relevant data? Well, in the case of um, our side of the business, where we're looking at uh, that information, it's a question of having the right technology um, to be able to search that data or ingest that data or have partnerships with um, providers of that data. And while this may not answer the question entirely, um, the secret, I think Michael McCartan mentioned to it earlier, it's not just a question of a lot of data or more data. It's about what insight you can provide uh, a system or indeed a hotelier from that data. So the, the so-called magic source is being able to take that information from many, many places, um, analyze it, package it up, visualize it necessary, but put it into something that can be actionable from a, a system like an RMS or indeed um, through a dashboard or platform to a individual. So I don't think it really answers the question that's being asked, but uh, that's, that's the position that we can put on that particular topic. Okay, fair, fair answer. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna expand on this topic a little bit of uh, industry automation uh, a little bit more broadly, um, because as I mentioned, the concept is gonna be making its way into all parts of our business. 
Um, Don at Bookboost specializes in the digital guest journey, especially around messaging. Um, Don, if you could tell us how you see the growing importance of automation as well as how price and automation impacts maybe guest touch points um, that you're dealing with on a regular basis. Yeah, so exactly. So with like in, in our world, we, we very much look at, at the guest relationship, right? So uh, our, our role in the industry or we see our role in the industry as to enable hoteliers to build that. And when you look at today's digitized world, uh, where things go really fast and so on. I mean, there's so many distractions. It's really sort of difficult to get someone's attention and personalization there plays a key role. So, um, I mean, everyone wants, wants to feel special. And so with, with, with automation, the key really is to utilize that in such a way that it doesn't interfere with uh, treating your guests as unique individuals. And to just give an example of that, uh, because the trick really is to make someone feel special. Uh, if you ask with the booking confirmation uh, to the guest or what channel, as just as an example, they prefer receiving following on communication, you already give a sense of caring to the guest and you give options to the guest. And that has a tremendous effect on how then engagements are because everyone wants to feel like you treat them as a unique individual. So we very much look at providing like a setup so that as a, the hotelier, you, you, can, you can make your operations more efficient while looking at how does that value, how, did, how does that add value to the guest so that you make sure that you treat each of your guests as individuals. And, and that's where, where you really see uh, the best results with, that, with those two components basically. It's kind of like automation in order to help improve personalization. So um, as opposed to the concern that automation removes personalization, this is- Precisely, yeah, uh, that's sort of the fine line. Yeah, yeah. So can I ask a question, uh, uh, Dan, on that? Um, so so, the, so the, prior to the booking process, uh, you know, the, the tools that you provide are also uh, a chat thing on the, on, the, on the hotel's website. Do guests, uh, you know, chat before they book? Do they, uh, you know, ask for special deals before they book? And if so, what, what do you do with that data? Because I think that could be useful for RMSs or things like OTA Insights to, to do stuff with and to use in price calculations. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, in, in general, when you look at, uh, when you analyze phone calls and, and emails that, that hotels get, about 50% is about new bookings and about 50% is about adjustments on bookings. And basically chat is another channel, right? So it makes it easier for, for you as the, as the guest or as the consumer uh, to use that at any time convenient. And it's much more, um, it, it sort of like fits more into, into your own uh, time because uh, making a phone call and email is a bit more time con consuming and and so on. So we look very much at, okay, applying the same principle in chat because it's, it's the same, like it's, it's just making uh, it more accessible for the guests to reach out to the hotelier and for the hotelier to manage that. Because one of the great things with chat and people indeed do use this for the same purpose is that once you have that data uh, digital, because it's difficult to obviously automate phone calls and, and emails as well. And the great thing with chat is once you have that the data digital, then you can start to see patterns as well, and also use that for uh, for driving direct bookings. So guests use it, and for the hotelier, um, it's just making yourself even more accessible for your guests and sort of lowering the threshold because often it's little things that guests are not sure about that can make a big impact on making them feel secure about their booking, and that helps for uh, for getting more direct bookings. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Paul, can um, I just jump in? I think it, it, it's, yeah. I mean, it's quite it's quite interesting because um, we've also, we've spoken about sort of personalized pricing for some time in revenue management, uh, and one of the challenges we've had, and the reason why personalized pricing doesn't really exist in a meaningful way yet, and, and by personalized pricing, I mean basically offering a price that's unique to every single one of us as an individual based on our needs at the time that we're booking, and we may be, wear multiple hats once you know. On one particular trip, we might be a business traveler, and another particular trip, we might be a, um, a leisure traveler. Um, and 
our sense of willingness to pay in those different scenarios is different. But if we can capture the data that Dan's been talking about and bring that into the pricing algorithms and genuinely offer a price that's you know, unique to me at that moment, we'll be able to convert more guests because we're offering the right product at the right price to the right person. But it's been really difficult. And, and one of the big challenges as um, the, we as an industry face is getting that clean personal data. We, we're starting to get good data in terms of shopping requests and air, air traffic and, and, and some of the stuff that Mike uh, Menard spoke about, but in getting really clean personal data that allows us to price independently uh, for every visit is quite difficult, but I see that as a as the next frontier. And if we can crack that nut, if we can con consolidate and cleanse personal data in a way that allows us to use it in a meaningful way, we'll, it'll really elevate pricing to a, a level we've not seen before. Interesting, interesting. Um, uh, Michael Linton, I want to give you an opportunity to to speak on this. Um, you know, we've we've been talking um, about um, a lot of different things re regarding automation, and again, from your perspective, you're your company has a um, kind of a, a breadth of touch points on a lot of different technologies. How is automation impacting um, the, the guest experience and how is it impacting how your product is being delivered? Sure, yeah, we've, I mean, really we're seeing that you're trying to touch every logical point of the guest journey that you can um, with data automation to make that experience as personalized as you possibly can from the time that they see an ad for your property via Google, perhaps, um, you know, we're seeing pricing automation going into there where you're showing actual live rates um, and inventory messaging right there from the, you know, initial advertisement they're seeing in Google down into the website, um, you know, where you, you're wanting to automate pricing and start positioning and showing a price on the website itself down through the booking engine. And then, you know, it hands off into what Dom is saying um, into, you know, chat as well as on property communications between that guest. I feel like it's a matter of bringing all those platforms together um, and really synergizing that overall guest experience for consistency from start to finish. And I think that that's where the industry is heading ultimately, because, you know, the more people become used to, you know, checking in from their, phone when they land and not having to go to the front desk and then be able to walk directly to a room, the more reliant they're going to become uh, on those types of technologies and conveniences. So I think it's important for various companies to always come, to come together and, uh, and leverage that data. So that's, you know, really what we're seeing. And ultimately, I agree with Michael in the sense that, um, you know, for each of those touch points, it's ideal to eventually be able to present a unique rate to that person at every single touch point. But things that we're seeing that are immediately available are things like welcoming the customer back once they visited your website and they've conducted a search for a specific uh, set of dates. Don't act like you don't know them when they come back, serve up the exact dates they had served previously. Um, we're seeing you know, tremendous increases in conversion rate from little things like that. And I think building upon that is what's gonna be really what uh, brings the, uh, the wave, the new wave um, for unique and personal, uh, personalized pricing. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, when it comes to, to trying to, um, everyone talks about the, the, the booking funnel and, and improving conversion and that, that, that personalization of pricing, you know, you know, if you know that they've looked for something, they're coming back, they're obviously comparing pricing. What can you say, what can you do to the price and what can you say about the price? Um, that could improve that conversion. I, I like that. Um, you, uh, Michael Murnick, you and I had spoken the other day offline about um, different ways your market data is getting to customers. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how revenue management's uh, revenue managers best work with automated pricing and automated data feeds? Yeah, I think um, I think it's a common question. You know, do you go a hundred percent automated or do you simply take recommendations and, and, and apply them manually. I think the um, realistic answer is a combination of both, Paul, actually. I think automation can get to pricing decisions fast and the revenue manager can be pretty confident that it's a data-driven decision. And often, you know, many times it can go straight into the systems and, and price accordingly. But I think in these 
uncertain times, as mentioned already, you know, we are a little less reliant on those historical bookings, those on the books data and, and pricing from competitors. And so the revenue manager you know, can weave in you know, knowledge about future demand and maybe customer intent by using tools that are given that information and then you know, fine tune some of those price recommendations. So automation all the way to creating a price recommendation, in some cases automating going to the system, but maybe just a pause, give a revenue manager the opportunity to apply some additional uh, insight or, or expertise. But we could take it one step further, right? I mean, we can create extra automation by having the RMS take in or digest this travel to booking intent and forward looking data. And this is something that we're already doing with Atomize and Michael here on the call. And it's helping them take on that forward looking customer intent data into their algorithm and improving the accuracy of the price decisions in their solutions. So we could be pretty close to it, not, we're never going to eliminate the revenue manager. That's the last one I do. We want to enable them so they can make good value decisions and not spend their time uh, digging into the data. I guess finally and sadly, um, the pandemic means that we don't have as many staff in hotels as before. So increasing automation is ultimately necessary to do the same or more work with less people. So I can see hotels coming out of this uh, period embracing certainly more automation as a result. Um, it seemed there was a question that we got that said, despite automation and, and price and inventory recommendations, revenue managers still manually override these. Why do we think that happens? And do we think we can reach greater adop adoptance of these recommendations? I mean, it sounds like we're saying, um, unfortunately, uh, because of staffing, you know, it, it's going to be, it's going to get down to a combination, in my opinion, of, of staffing and, and performance, you know, at some point, um, competitive pressures, people who are going to be adopting pricing automation are going to be incrementally being the leaders in their, their comp set. And so I think revenue manager adoption is basically going to be, there will be pressured based on performance purposes and also quite frankly, on, on labor hours. Um, would anyone like to kind of weigh in on that, uh, the, the adoption of these um, technologies? Yeah, I can take that. Without doubt, Paul, you, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's just the machine's going to be able to validate, ingest, look at, analyze, and, and decide a price far, far more efficiently than, than a human can. And I think the reason that we're seeing high overrides um, or historically I've seen high, high overrides is simply a trust, trust issue. I, um, in order to fully automate your, your pricing strategy, you need to have a lot of trust in your application and, and ensure, you know, believe that the prices that they are recommending or it's recommending is the, is the right price. And it, it's hard to know for sure, but Clearly, uh, machine technology has has capabilities, as I said, in terms of testing simulations and things like that, which are superior than than human processing power. But it it is beholden on the the system to provide sufficient metadata around that pricing to satisfy the user that this is the right price. So they don't have to spend a lot of time analyzing and deciding whether the machine was right or wrong and 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 overriding. Um, it was quite interesting. One of my, my previous customers, actually, they, they were seeing up something like a 30, 40% override rate um, from, from their revenue management team. And they, they f felt that that was suboptimal. Why were they paying you know, a for a revenue management system when nearly half of the time the, the pricing decisions would have been overridden? And so they wanted to see what was happening. What, was the revenue manager right or was the, the machine right? And it was inconclusive in, 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 in um, you know, sometimes the revenue manager was right, sometimes the machine was right. But I think as we start consuming more and more data, as there's more and more time pressure on revenue managers, I think there's going to be an inevitable uh, case where that trust is just going to have to be developed. And it's beholden on companies like mine to, to deliver that trust and, and validate and provide the metadata, as I said, around those decisions so that the revenue manager is comfortable just letting it run on autopilot. Right. Uh, ultimately, you're making the revenue managers look better, you know, with, with, with the performance of your tool. Yeah. Um, I, also, Paul, I, I think 
<clears throat> just to add to that, I, I think the, the revenue, the traditional manual revenue management process is very much focused on what happened in the past and some forecast that goes, you know, pretty far out. Whereas I think an uh, automated revenue management system, um, and especially as I understand automized space, do I know any other ones out there? Um, <clears throat> they focus on what happens right now with the booking. What, what, what is going on right now? Is my you know, is my booking pattern increasing? Are people booking more? So I need to increase my price right now. And that happens all within, you know, seconds, basically. Um, so I would almost think that would always, especially now when the future is kind of very uncertain. And I've talked to many hotel managers and revenue managers, and it's very hard to forecast right now because nobody knows really. Um, but then an automation, an automated system that can track What's going on today, tomorrow, and the day after can immediately adjust and increase or decrease the price. I think so. I think I think it, it seems to make very good use of, of revenue management tools right now as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so we've been talking a lot about um, the acquisition side of the business. I think that you know we're, everyone is always uh, obsessed with getting the reservation. Uh, the reality is that we have relatively low occupancy, and what we really want to do is we want you know, we want to try to maximize the dollars that we're getting out of the guests that we get because occupancy is going to be low. Hence, I mean, I think that there is a, more of a focus on upsells and add-ons uh, that right now, the pricing of which are rarely, if ever, automated. Um, I guess like, my question for Michael McCartan is, um, do you see those other revenue channels being automated in the future? You know, what do you think about this? Yes, I, I do actually. And I th you know, essentially, it's just inventory, and um, anything, any piece of inventory can be yielded and can be priced automatically. Uh, it is, it is contingent on there being sufficient data, and I think that's possibly why we haven't seen a big demand for that yet, or in a massive step progression in terms of um, pricing that ancillary type stuff, because the, the access to the data is is limited. Um, but already you can see it in terms of up room upgrades, if you independently yielding your different room types, um, you, you can then very easily offer a dynamic room upgrade. You know, so if I book a standard room three weeks in advance and demand for my standard room is increasing up to the day of arrival, so the price is increasing, but I'm not seeing the same pickup for my superior rooms. In other words, the, the system should reduce that, the, the, the price for the superior room. It, it offers a natural and an affordable upgrade path for someone who booked the standard room a while ago. So you're not, you know, what would typically happen in a hotel is they would give that upgrade to free, uh, upgrade to that person for free when they checked in because, and that, that you know, they'd be diluting revenue. So just, you know, two to three days before arrival, offer that same person um, an upgrade because you have all the data, you know what the price for the that superior room is. Just offer it to them as an increment on what they've already spent. And um, right. the more the more we can do that, the more data we have around other other services, the more we'll be able to dynamically price those. Yeah, yeah. And Dan, do you know, what, what, what's your perspective on on that concept? Of, you know, kind of the the ancillary services and um, you know uh, how the automation is impacting those. Yeah, right. And, and then we're, we're actually looking into T ref bar, right, which, uh, which stands for total revenue per available room. So that includes ancillary revenue. And yeah, indeed, I mean, uh, totally like the number one reason why, um, why there's, there's a select number of hotels that are actually successfully utilizing that is that most workflows are still manual and, and inconsistent. So to really like successfully do this, you, you can look at it as a framework. So where you first uh, find a way to actually reach your guest and ideally with a personal and, uh, and a message and in a way that resonates. Uh, so then the guest is more likely to also uh, convert on if you send them an offer, for instance, because it feels it's relevant for them. So once, once you've succeeded in that, then you need an operation system that makes sure that then the service actually gets delivered and a workflow that enables that for um, for your operations, right? And then you also need to monitor that so that you can look into uh, the results of what, what it's doing and ideally also ask the guest how that service has contributed to their stay. So ask uh, for a feedback loop, whether that has, has done good or not, so that you know and that you can measure 
uh, on how this is also impacting the guest experience. And once you have that all that in place, uh, and, and of course, uh, there's some part of there that, uh, that you should and can automate, then you can start looking into conversion rates. Um, yeah, I mean, here at Bookboost, we're a big fan of, of personalization. Uh, yeah. that's, that's what we're thinking uh, about a lot. And uh, yeah, the key really is that once you are relevant and once you can send value adding messages uh, that, guests, uh, that guests feel uh, engaged on, then they're also much more likely to uh, engage on offers because they rather feel like you're thinking about them and you're caring about them than that you're like pushing something, something on them. So sure. that, that's, that's, that's a little bit uh, how we look at it. Um. So I think that, um, you know, as, as a segue, I, I want, I want to, you, you, we were talking about uh, ancillary guest services. We're talking about um, improving conversion. Um, you know, Yas, can you tell us a little bit about your experience that you're seeing at your company in terms of the performance of conversion in ancillary guest services, uh, specifically like, you know, early arrival, late departure, that kind of thing? Yeah, um, I certainly can. I, I, I think uh, Michael McCarthy mentioned that earlier, Dan, as well. Uh, you know, when you offer auxiliary revenue, you have to ensure you can fulfill it. It's from a pricing point of view, hard to get by the pricing, unless I think it's room revenue related. Um, so just as, as machines and, and technology is optimizing the price to buy the room, there are also, I think there should also be a good good process to automate the 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 pricing of the upgrade as well as the pricing of, for example, early arrival and late departure. I mean, there is the, um, there is the belief, contrary to the belief that guests don't wanna, you know, should get an offer for, for an early arrival or late departure for free, they actually don't mind paying for it at all in most, in many, if not most cases, if it's guaranteed that they can get into the room early, the room early and can, or can stay later if they need to, especially now with, with everybody, you know, having to stay away in social areas and all that kind of stuff and social distance. But even prior to the uh, COVID, um, you know, pandemic, when I was at St. Touch, where we had also early check-in and late check-out as part of the application, it was doing really well, uh, providing the pricing was normal. Now, uh, if you can automate that pricing, you can actually enhance the the, the ADR that you get from, from a one or two night stay very easily with proper offering of room upgrade and early check-in and late check-out. And we've seen, we've, we've offered this solution as part of our uh, product now for the last two months, uh, early arrival and late departure, and we've seen great uptake on it. You know, 68% of the people uh, bought one or the other, and the average price increase basically adds up to 30% to the to the one night stay, which is significant. You know, if somebody pays $150 for a room and you can get another $30, $40 just for an early arrival, late departure, and everybody's happy, that's a great thing. The importance though, and this is what Dan mentioned, is you have to be able to deliver on it. So that requires some automation. You have to make sure that each room type to which you offer early arrival or late departure has plenty of rooms available to offer that early arrival so that there is no constraints at the front desk and that it can easily be fulfilled and everybody gets what they want which I think can only be achieved if you truly automate it. And to the point of uh, offering automated pricing for upgrades, um, it's, I think that that's, that's, that's also key because the price of the upgrade that you offer has to be in line with the rate that the guest paid. It doesn't make sense to offer your standard upgrade of let's say $100 for somebody that paid $100 for the room that he bought. If that person had bought $300, he may be willing to pay $100 for the upgrade. But somebody who paid $100 is not going to pay the same amount again to get an upgrade. Otherwise, he would have bought it in the first place. So there, again, I think the, the optimization becomes really important. And that kind of can only be done automated. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of personalization. It's not exactly personalization, but it's sort yeah. of. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Michael Linton, uh, from, from your perspective, I'd like we're talking about uh, you know, ancillary guest revenue sources, um, you know, guest, guest feelings about early check-in, late departure, you know, optimizing the revenue you get on all revenue streams. What's your perspective on this? Sure. I, I mean, we see lots of hotel partners um, making great use of ancillary opportunities, uh, upsell, things like early check-in, late check-out. Um, I agree that, you know, you have to figure out a way to um, inventorize that. And the way 
we've traditionally done it is you hook it to a uh, particular rate plan room category that once you sell through a certain amount, you don't offer that particular um, add-on item on that particular day. Because naturally, if you have a 100-room hotel, you surely can't offer 100 early check-ins. You'll find yourself in a, in a pickle real fast. Um, so in addition to that, you know, what, what we've seen, and it's particularly become important during the pandemic, uh, are customers offering their own version of a trip insurance, which you know, I'll charge you $30 more and you can cancel up until day of arrival, but whether or not you cancel or stay, I'm keeping that $30. So they've in turn increased the value of the reservation uh, while providing the customer with the comfort and flexibility of knowing that they could cancel without forfeiting their entire deposit. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I wonder, you know, we're, we're uh, coming towards the top of the hour here. Uh, and so I wanted to actually get to a, um, a question or two from the audience. Um, somebody had written about sometimes revenue management managers use gut, gut instinct. Um, they know their own business segments and so forth. Um, and and uh, they say ultimately customer lifetime value needs to be written into the equation, particularly when it comes to pricing automation. Um, so uh, can this type of guest knowledge be automated? And so I'm gonna open this up to um, everybody on the floor. Um, I mean, it, it, maybe this is a Michael Murnock question, given it's uh, sort of the, the ability to pull data, um, but anybody can weigh in on this. I think, yeah, I think Michael talked to it briefly. It's um, something that we've been talking about for a long time, something we all want to do. Uh, perhaps the reason why we haven't done it systemically is because it's just difficult to get that data in any sort of accurate um, and complete and in real time way. So I think it's definitely something that should be planned into long term for the algorithms. But I think the big question is how do we acquire that data and how do we indeed analyze it and make it bring it realistically into a system. So I don't know if Michael's got any further comments to make about that. No, you're absolutely right, Michael. It's it's about acquiring that data and really understanding your guests or so having a 360 degree profile of your guests. And, and only then will you really understand the true life, lifetime value of, the, of each and every guest. And, and then you can make pricing decisions based on, on that information. You know, you can, and casinos do this all the time already. You know, they will offer a cheap room to a, a high roller because they know that the value of that guest in the long term is much, much greater than the value of an expensive room for a, a week. And, and uh, hotels will evolve to that, but it is dependent on there being much better data available. But, but that's, that's a fairly unique example. I think you're giving the Mark McCarthy and the Las Vegas, you know, or that, you know, the resort type of people, business where people go back to. But I think I would also argue that in general, you don't go back to the same hotel unless you have to go back to the same city, which in general, unless you have real reason, you're not doing. So most guests, in my opinion, I think go to a hotel once, maybe twice over a lifetime. Uh, and, and there's a very few amount of guests that may go back to the same hotel because I don't know, they have a certain affection with it, but that's a very small amount. And then there's there are some loyalty members that you know go across all Marriott's or all Hilton's, but that's you know across the globe or across the United United States. Um, but there's probably, but there's probably, there's probably opportunity in terms of chain-wide revenue management, you know, personalization. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think chain-wide, chain-wide there is, and, and relating it rather than personal, make it more persona-based, so it's more generic, and it can be applied to also people that only come one time to your hotel because you can, you can determine that one, you know, that is a like a business traveler, so he pays up to X. That's a leisure traveler, he pays up to Y. That's a family; they are worth something like that um, that's much easier data i think to get to and also reaches in my opinion a large much larger um, um, stake of your guests do i say that a sample of your guests basically because i think most guests i mean at least myself i mean i'm not a good example but most guests don't have a reason to go back to the same place unless they have family there or something so it's I think I think sometimes we're also focusing too much on that that very small amount of repeat guests. Um, too much, maybe. I think if we generalize it more, especially from a machine learning point of view, you have more opportunity and also ability to to increase revenues. 
Yeah, I agree. Uh, you, you're, it, it's it's about create, establishing personas and then being able to identify when someone visits your website or visits the whatever, is this person like that person? And then be you know using your data to then determine what someone like me would want to buy. And and, and so it's not it's not on a one to one level, but it, you are using that data to really determine the profile of each visitor and then and then assigning them to a bucket. I, I agree with you on that. And it's absolutely about understanding um, them at that early upper funnel or pre-booking stage. That that's, makes a difference. It occurs to me that if you know who's searching, which day dates they're looking for and how long they're planning to stay, it tells you quite a little bit, quite a lot about the, the um, guest. And you can then you know, target offers, uh, not necessarily specifically to the individual, of course, but from the marketing point of view, some of these offers we've talked about could be more precisely um, targeted to countries or cities, source markets, and get a, a greater uptake, and obviously therefore generate higher rev power. So um, we are now just a couple of minutes away from the top of the hour. Um, so what I would like to do is just go around the table and give um, all of our panelists an, uh, an opportunity to just give us just a couple sentences um, of advice to our hotel watchers um, you know, to help, what, what, what do they need to know coming out of this webinar to help them with revenue recovery and ADR? What's the takeaway? And I'm going to start with um, Don DeBrine. Yeah. I mean, uh, of course, you, everyone knows their own hotel best, right? So it's, it's, it's difficult to sort of give a tailored advice, but we always say um, that like regarding pricing, uh, the more consistent you are and the more also the more open you are about your strategies to your guests, um, sort of the more sustainable you'll, you'll formulate, formulate your strategy. And what we look at a lot is like how you can be unique and different because that's really what, 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 what keeps a memory for you as a guest. And look at like, perhaps look at your guest journey. We, we often advise like, uh, do an exercise, pretend you're opening a new hotel uh, and sketch your whole guest journey out and see where there are certain moments of truth where you can really like shine as your brand, uh, identify moments that are very important for you to convey a certain message and try to do something different than your competitors because that's really what sticks and that's what people remember and that's what uh, uh, will make people go back to you, to your hotel if they do so. That's good advice, good advice. Uh, Michael Linton, I'll let you... Uh... Give us a, your two words, two sentences of advice. Sure, I would say, um, you know, coming from the perspective of a CRS provider, take this opportunity to align your technology with your strategy. Um, I find, I've found recently that everybody's been so caught up in the day-to-day, -day, you know, prior to the pandemic, that many of them had forgotten some of the capabilities that were right there at their fingertips. And a lot of this functionality, is very useful for all the things that we've discussed today. So, you know, even if it's looking at your existing provider or looking at what, what else is out there, um, I would just say that it's, let's use this opportunity to uh, recalibrate and reset to, uh, to come back with a vengeance. No, understand your technology better. That's, that's good advice. Uh, Michael Murnock, um, your uh, two sentences of advice to our hotel watchers. Yeah, thanks, Paul. As representing a, an organization that provides business intelligence and market insights to the hospitality area. I mean, I'll just reiterate that to grow ADR and RevPAR in a market that's highly competitive and where normal or historical demand drivers are less reliable, that we use other ways to understand uh, future demand and that hotels look more at guest booking, pre-booking analysis and a larger and more dynamic competitor set when setting prices. I think automation um, by either getting to those conversations faster or automating that forward-looking customer intent into an RMS such as Atomize is also something we could do today, right, to improve the accuracy when automating uh, price setting. So adopt the technology, take data-led decisions, um, and still retain the integrity and expertise of the revenue manager in, um, in, in making those decisions. Well, well said, well said. Michael McCartan? I, I'm always going to echo Mike, but uh, I think it's, you know, given the uncertainty and the unpredictability in the market, I think all hotels um, need to give themselves an unfair advantage in capturing a greater share of what little demand there is when it comes. 
And to do that, you need better data and better automation. So it, it all, it's tough right now because budgets and, rev, and revenues under pressure, is, but I think the best thing you can do is prepare for the time when, when demand comes back, put yourself in the best position by, by investing in the right areas. Yeah, in my opinion, I mean, I think depending on your market, it's going to come back with a vengeance, you know, pretty quickly, you know, and it's, you know, pricing is going to you know, be all over the board. Um, yeah, so I'll let you uh, finish up. I'm going to finish up with what I think I say most of the webinars. I think make sure that your you should make sure that your PMS is in the cloud, that it's very innovative and that, well, sorry, that it's very easy to integrate with. And I would definitely focus uh uh, you know, updating a technology stack around automating automation of pricing with, and I think an immediate focus on room rooms revenue because that's where you can get your highest margin and your least amount of cost. Cool. Well, thank you, thanks everyone for attending. We uh, really appreciate your time. Um, as usual, to uh, our guests who are watching, uh, this webinar has been recorded and we will be uploading it to the uh, Roomdex website later today. Uh, you will re receive an email with a link as well. If you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us at info at roomdex.io. Um, we will do our best to um, answer, um, uh, send out some, inf uh, some information on or some answers to the questions that were posed that we were, in, were not able to get to today. Um, and last but not least, uh, we are going to have another revenue management focused webinar in April where we're inviting four RMS vendors to discuss uh, things, all revenue management. So uh, we'll be ha having folks from Atomize, Pace, Ideas, and Duetta. So that will also be very exciting. So um, please keep that in mind and uh, we hope to see you in April. Um, thanks very much and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks everyone. Bye everyone. <clears throat>